I have been a Christian for about... I've been a Christian for about 30 years. And the longer I am a Christian, the more I realize I'm not a very good one. Now, it's okay. In our, in our second Helvetic Confession, it says that the preaching of the Word of God is the Word of God. Even if the preacher is evil and a sinner. So I know that I'm not the first one who has been in this situation. God's Word has a power of its own. And... Uh, what, what it speaks to us in, in messages like this is not dependent on the instrument that God uses to, to deliver it. But, but I do feel that I am only beginning to learn just how much I need, I need God's help because I am not who I ought to be. The writer C.S. Lewis says that, that it is as we get better, we, we, uh, it is only as we get better that we learn about the evil inside of us. We learn about what keeps us from being better by challenging it. By, he says, you, um, you discover the strength of the wind when you walk against it, not when you walk with it. So, so he says that bad people really don't understand badness. Only good people understand badness. So, so I say this um, because my guess is that some of you feel that way. And um, you, you have thought to yourself, you know, I thought that... I would be a better person by now, that, that, that with God working in me, I would be all better. But, but um, I think what we learn is that we um, aren't, that, that many of us as Christians don't live the way we ought to. And there's two ways of looking at that. One of, one of it is the way I think a lot of people do, which is say Christians are all hypocrites. They say one thing and then they do something else. And, and I know that that's, that's the message a lot of people take from the way Christians behave. Uh, Gandhi he said that, um, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians because they're so unlike your Christ. And so he saw Christians as being hypocrites, people who, who said one thing and then did another. And that's, that's one way, and sometimes it's a fair way to look at, look at the way Christians live. But I think another way to look at it, us is that we try and fail, that we, we don't live up to our standards. It's not that we don't have standards, it's that we we fail to live up to them. And so sometimes it's, it is hypocrisy and sometimes it's because our flesh is weak. And, and when that's the case, we have a question, what do we do about that? I think, I think a lot of times what we try to do is we just say, well, I'm just gonna try and fly under the radar. Maybe it leads to a kind of imposter syndrome in it where we kind of look around and we say, all these people, you know, they're so much better than me. Um, if they knew what I was really like, if they knew what I did last night or if they knew what I did a month ago or 10 years ago, they'd kick me out of here. And you know, there's some truth in that. They might because, because they're Christians and Christians, as Gandhi observed, are not always like Christ. So sometimes we feel like, well, all I can do is just kind of uh, keep it on the down low. I don't want people to know what I'm really like. And so that's one possibility is, is I'm not going to share my struggles with you because then you'll see my failures. So that's one thing we do. Another thing we do is we say, you know what, I, I give up. I'm just going to, I'm just going to be a hypocrite. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say one thing and do another. I, I realize I will never defeat this thing that I struggle with. And so I'm going to quit struggling. And I'll just let people think I, I do. I'm going to try to pretend to be a better person than I am. So, so sometimes we say, all right, I'm going, to, I'm going to hope nobody notices what I'm really like. And sometimes we say, I'm going to fool them. I'm going, to, I'm going to make sure they don't know what I'm really like. But there is a third option, and I want to talk about the third option today. Um, we have been in this conversation, we've, we just began it last week, about the, the life of the patriarch Jacob. So Jacob is the the grandson of Abraham. Abraham is the patriarch of the, of the Jewish people. Uh, his, his son Isaac is the father of Jacob. And Jacob, in turn, is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. So he's, well, he's the father of the 12 sons of, of Jacob, who in turn become the 12 tribes of Israel. So Judah and Levi and all the others. So, so Jacob is this great figure in the Bible. And um, we have begun to see he's not he, he's great in the sense that he he looms large in the bible but he's not great in the sense of you want to have him over to, for dinner 
He's not a good guy, right? Last, last week um, we saw, and, and if you weren't here, you didn't see it, it's online so you can catch up online. But what we saw is that Jacob is not a good guy, that, that he squeezes every opportunity he has. He, he's looking out for number one, and if you're in a vulnerable spot and he can exploit it, he will. That's what we saw last time because he, he, his, his uh, brother Esau was hungry, his brother uh, uh, was a hunter, and uh, he'd gone out on a bad hunt and didn't get any food, and he was hungry, and Jacob uh, leveraged that, that to squeeze uh, his birthright out of, out of his brother Esau. So we've seen he's not a good guy, but in chapter 27, we see he's worse than that because he doesn't simply kind of push as far as he can go. He goes beyond that. He swindles his dad into giving him his brother's blessing. He pretends to be his brother so he can steal his brother's blessing out from underneath his father's nose. He plays his father for a fool so he can steal what does not belong to him. He's not a good guy. But his mom loves him. You know, that's mom's for you. And so mom hears Esau plotting. Esau says, you know, the old man's going to die pretty soon. And when he does, I'm going to kill my brother. And mom hears this and she says, Jacob, you better scoot. You better get out of here. Go back to my home country where I, where I originally came from. Go back to Haran and they'll take care of you and then Esau won't kill you. So that's where we pick up our story today. So, so Jacob is on the run. He's, he's on the lamb and he's trying to get away from his brother before his brother catches him. So that's the place where we pick up the story. And um, we are going to... Uh, Start at verse 10 of chapter 28. So, so it says, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. So where are these places? Well, we always start with the Mediterranean world. So that's the Mediterranean world in the, the Near East. And we're going to look at that little uh, section there, that, that uh, square. And so here it is. We're zooming in on that square. And um, so those are the two places, Beersheba far in the south, and then Haran way up at the top of the Fertile Crescent. So... So he's going back to his home country uh, in modern-day Turkey. And uh, we read in verse 11, it says, He reached a certain place and spent the night now there. We're going to find out in a few verses the name of that place is Bethel or Luz. And so that's where it is. So he's really just begun his journey. He's about 70 miles from home, and uh, he's got another, I don't know, 600 miles to go. So he's, uh, he's got some, some traveling but this is the first night, and it's telling that he, you know, he is not taking advantage of Middle Eastern hospitality. He didn't go knock on somebody's door and say, hey, I'm on, I'm on a journey. Can you take me in for the night? Um, no, he didn't do that. And the reason is because he doesn't have any friends. He's never spent any time getting friends because he's not a good guy. He always squeezes people, and now he's running away from them. So... So he reaches this certain place and he spends the night there. When the sun sets, he took one of the stones at that place and put it under his, or put it near his head. Um, there's ambiguity in the text. I've seen this as he puts it under his head or near his head. I don't know. It doesn't sound very comfortable to me either way, but um, sometimes it's translated as a pillow. He used it as a pillow. But um, something to do with the stone uh, near him. And then he lay down and he slept. So there's nothing surprising about that except that he is outdoors because he doesn't have anybody that he can ask a favor of. So he reached a certain place and he lay down there and he dreams. He dreams and he sees a raised staircase, its foundation on earth and its top touching the sky. Now the word uh, for staircase here, um, I looked it up and uh, it is a very rare word so no one is really quite sure what it means. It's closely related to the words for ladder and ramp. So it's a ladder ramp. And, you know, we don't know exactly, but it's something that goes up and you walk up and down it. And it's interesting, this is a reminder to us, the angels are using this ramp. I think a lot of us have, a, have an image in our head of angels having wings, but only two types of angels have wings. The, the cherubs and the seraphs have wings. All the other angels look like people. So they're walking like the rest of us. So... So the angels, I don't know how often they go up and down. There's speculation what's going on here. It could be that this is 
the, the angels, the, the, uh, our translation says messengers. That's literally what, a, what an angel is. Um, an angel is a messenger of God. And so either they're just kind of coming and going as part of their role of keeping tabs on what's going on in the earth and reporting back to God, uh, maybe occasionally sending a message from God to somebody. Uh, maybe that's what's going on. Or maybe it's something to do with the fact that, that um, Jacob is now far from home. He's, he's left home, and so the angel who normally watches him is, is going back up to heaven and the, a different angel, a traveling angel, comes to watch him or something. So nobody knows exactly what's going on in this dream. But the angels are, are um, only the opening to it because then in verse 13 it says, Suddenly the Lord was standing on it, the ladder, and saying, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. So this is the place where God catches up with Jacob, right? He's gotten away with it. He got away with so much. He's stolen his birth. He's stolen his brother's um, blessing. He's squeezed the, ble- the, the birthright out of his brother. He's, he's, been, um, he's been looking out for number one, and now he's fleeing his responsibility. He won't go back home and face the music. So he thinks he's gotten away clean, and God shows up. And this is the place where he knows that he's busted. And we can just imagine what God is going to tell him. God is going to say, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac, your grandfather and your father. I am the God who spoke to them, and you are the worst of the bunch. You're the worst one I've ever seen. You're terrible. I saw what you did. I've been watching you, and it's time for you to justify what you've done. That's what we might imagine God would say, right? God says, I pay attention to these things. I've got these angels going up and down who keep tabs for me in case I, something slips my mind. God knows what Jacob's been up to. And this is the place where the hammer's going to come down, right? I mean, he's exposed, he's vulnerable, he's out there in the middle of nowhere, there's nobody he can call for help. He is so busted. So what does God say? God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you in 11 different ways or 17 or whatever the number is. He says, "Um, I will give you and your descendants the land on which you're lying. Your descendants will become like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west, east, north, south. He says, your brother Esau has got three wives at this point and you've got none, but that's okay. I'm going to bless you with descendants, right? Not him, you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to, I'm going to um, give you the land that, that you're on, and your descendants will spread out from there. Uh, again, this is a place where there's some ambiguity. Does it, mean, does it mean they're going to spread out across the whole earth or just in that area around, around um, Bethel? So one way or the other, they're going to get the Holy Land. But, but God goes on and says, whether they, whether they sp- expand out to the ends of the earth or not, he says, every family of earth, including Esau's family, including every family of earth, will be blessed because of you and your descendants. So God promises him land and descendants, but also a key role, a vital role, in God's plan of salvation for the world. So you're, gonna, you're, you're, you're a significant person. And what's amazing is that, is that he, he, says, he says this, um, Without, without Jacob having to squeeze it out of him. Jacob doesn't try to swindle him. Jacob doesn't you know, squeeze and say, God, I need more than that. God just says, here, I'm going to give you more than you could possibly hope for. And oh, and by the way, I noticed your situation. I noticed your predicament. So God says, um, I am with you now. I will protect you everywhere you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done everything I have promised you. So God says all these things to a really bad person. I mean, not a good person for sure. He says it to Jacob, Jacob the the swindler, Jacob the heel grabber. And what's, what's amazing is that God does this to a bad person. When we're thinking about the way that that we aren't who we ought to be, that, you know, if only they knew what I'm like. 
We have great company. That's who Jacob is. That's this person that God makes these promises to. Somebody who is not a good person. And not only that, you notice, so, so um, I guess the first, the first point, if you're following the bulletin, the first point is that God blesses Jacob not because of who he is, but despite who he is. God blesses despite, not because. That God looks at Jacob and says, you're not great, but I will make you great. I don't expect you to be great. I expect to make you great. And so that's what God promises to do. Notice also what, what he, he says. He says that, that it's, not because, it's not because you're great, but more than that, he says, and I don't expect you to try, right? I, I'm, not, I'm not going to make this conditional on your behavior. God doesn't say what we sometimes do. God doesn't say, if you stop cheating people, if you stop swindling people, if you go back and face the music, God doesn't put any conditions on this at all. God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to protect you and bless you in all these ways, period. It's unconditional. So the second point, God's blessings are unconditional. God says, I'm just going to do it. Now, that is a good dream. That is a good dream. And the problem, I think, as Westerners, we, we look at dreams and we kind of look down on dreams. We say it's just kind of, you know, static, you know, in our, you know, it's, it's nothing. It's, it's just mindless jumble of thoughts in our head when we're asleep and not able to think properly. But that's not the way people thought about it in the, in the ancient world. In the ancient world, you would say, okay, well, you got an angel. An angel came and gave you a message, but I got a dream, right? And we kind of see that in this, in this passage, right? The angels come and go. Angels aren't all that important, right? But I got a dream. I was given a dream of God promising these things to me. So maybe that's a thought, you know, we, we could take with us is, you know, maybe I should, maybe I should take my dreams more, more seriously. Maybe I should do a better job of getting sleep so that I can have dreams to take more seriously. Maybe I should listen more to my dreams because maybe that's the place God is going to reach me. I think most of us hold out for an angel, but the picture here is an angel, you know, if, if you're waiting, you know, when, when God sends me an angel, then I'll do the thing, right? An angel is not nearly as important a, a sign of God's grace as, an, as a dream would be. So watch out for those dreams. So Jacob wakes up. I mean, that was a good dream, right? That was a really good dream. And he says... He says, the Lord is definitely in this place, but I didn't know it. He was terrified and thought, this sacred place is awesome. It's none other than God's house and the entrance to heaven. So the entrance to heaven, the gate, um, the heaven's gate, this is the place where you get in. And so he names it God's house. Um, he got up early in the morning. He took the stone he'd set near his head, set it up as a sacred pillar, a standing stone, an Ebenezer, and he pours oil on the top of it. And he named that sacred place Bethel, so Bethel, house of God. He named it Bethel, though Luz was the city's original name. And he makes a solemn promise. He says, if God is with me and protects me on this trip I'm taking and gives me bread and clothes and I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. You see the contrast between his promise and God's promise. God's is unconditional. God's is not based on anything the other one does. Uh, Jacob's is conditional. Or uh, again, this is this is the word if. It's like it's our, our our word if. It can mean if. It could be basically if God's going to do all those things, then and only then will I do the following things. Maybe it means that. Maybe it means when. Once God has done those things, then I'll be in a position to, to, um, to respond in a particular way. But it can also mean since. It can mean, wow, I like this plan. I'm, I'm going to, to jump on board. You know, you don't get an offer like this every day. I'm going to seize this opportunity that God has presented to me, right? I'm going to grasp, as Jacob is known for doing, 
here's this amazing plan that God has presented to me, and I'm going to take it. So he might be just saying, I'm going to take yes for an answer. So he sets up a stone and uh, as a sacred pillar to mark God's house, and of everything God gives him, um, uh, I will give a tenth back to you. So, so he does these three things. He says, he says, if God's going to do all those things, then by all means, I want this God to be my God. Right? I want this God. And then he says, and I'll make a memorial because this, something, this good needs to be remembered. I need to hold on to this. And then he says, oh, and I'm also going to give God a tenth of what he gives me. Now, Jacob is such a schemer. I'm not sure this is really a nice thought. Maybe it's like, well, God, if you give me $10, I'll give you one. But if you give me a hundred, I'll give you ten. You know, it's in it's to your advantage, God. You get more back the more you give me. Uh, you know, th- I wouldn't put that past Jacob because because he's still got a lot of growing to go. But he offers a tithe, and and I will point out to you, he offers a tithe. This is where this is where, there's a handful of passages in the scriptures where the tithe comes from, and I will point out this is before the giving of the law. This is four hundred years before God gives the people the law at Mount Sinai. There's no requirement that he does this. This is something he does optionally. And we're in the same position because Jesus has fulfilled the law. And so you are under no obligation to tithe, but it might be the right thing to do anyway. I I do it. Margo and I tithe because we believe it's the right thing to do. It's a way to remember every month, you know, look at all the ways that God has blessed us. Here, I'm happy to give God a tenth of what I've got. So I encourage you to do that, but, but it is not a requirement. This is, you would be in the same position that Jacob is, simply saying, I, this, you know, every month I count my blessings and give God a tenth of them. So it could mean that, um, and I encourage you to think about it in that way. So, so, um, so he responds by saying, that is, a, that is the best deal I'm going to hear. Nobody else is going to offer me this kind of deal, so I'm going to take it. And I'm going to do these things in, in response. So the third, the third point in the, in the program is that um, bl- God's blessings call forth gratitude. That if you're, not, if, you're not, if you're not grateful to God, then maybe it's because you haven't looked at the way God's blessed you. So I encourage you, think about the ways that, yeah, they're, they're in the wrong place. That's, my, that's on me. But here they all arrive at the last moment. So um, God's blessings do call forth gratitude. So you might think to yourself, maybe it's on me. Maybe what I need to do is like, like Jacob. I need to say, hey, you know what? If God's going to do this and God's going to do that and God's going to do that, why am I not more grateful? So I encourage you, think about it that way. And, and maybe, maybe when you do, you'll want to set up some kind of a standing stone. Maybe you'll want to have something, some tangible thing that helps you remember what God has done for you. Maybe that thing is a monthly check to your church or something else that you believe represents God for you. But God gave us another way to remember what he's done. God gave us something better than a stone. In John's gospel, Jesus says that he is Jacob's ladder, that we as his disciples will see the angels of God going up and down on him. And he gave us a different sign. He gave us the sign of the table to remember the ways that God has blessed us. We're about to receive the sacrament of communion, and I invite you to prepare your hearts so that you may receive it truly as a gift from God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are grateful that there is a third option besides flying under the radar, hoping nobody realizes how far from being Christ-like we are, or simply throwing in the towel and pretending, being hypocrites. We have another option, which is to receive greatness from you, to be like Jacob, to simply take what you have to offer us at the pace that you offer it, Help us to trust in your promises and help, our, help us to be thoughtful and creative in ways to remember that in Christ you have provided 
a marker, a blessing, so that we can remember all of your promises as we wait for them to be fulfilled. We pray it in his name. Amen.